Good morning, and welcome to worship at Westminster Presbyterian Church. A special welcome is extended to our guests and visitors. We are delighted that you have joined us for online worship as we continue our journey toward Holy Week and find ourselves in the midst of a wilderness of sorts, unexpectedly, facing this unprecedented public health challenge. The preacher in Ecclesiastes affirms that for everything, there is a season and a time for every matter under the heavens. We find ourselves in a time to refrain from embracing for the well-being of our community. We are grateful for the resilience of the human spirit and the steadfast love of God which empowers us to persevere through this time of being apart. We look forward to the personal and spiritual renewal that will grow out of this seed that has been suddenly planted in our lives. We anticipate a new perspective and a new appreciation for the beauty of our life together as a result of this time apart. And we are grateful for the immortal, invisible God who joined us in our humanity, who holds us in our uncertainties, and who renews our strength. Let us be called to worship with these words from the prophet Isaiah. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. God does not faint or grow weary. God's understanding is unsearchable. God gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Friends, let us worship God together.
As the church, we are called to do what is pleasing to the Lord and to participate in what is good and right and true. At this time, we pause to acknowledge our need for forgiveness and to bring our confession to God. Let us pray. Faithful Lord, as we venture through the season of Lent and wonder when our time in the wilderness will end, our tendency is to forget that we belong to you. Forgive us for not trusting you when we feel isolated and alone. Break the chains of doubt and free us from our own uncertainties. Help us to be born again into life of Christ, trusting that you have adopted us by grace into the family of faith. Hear now our silent prayer of confession. The psalmist assures us that God's goodness and mercy will follow us, even pursue us, all the days of our lives. As God's forgiven people, receive this goodness and mercy and live a new life in grace of Jesus Christ. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. The peace of Christ be with you. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our first scripture reading is from the 137th Psalm, verses 1 through 4. This Psalm of Lament speaks of the Hebrew people's sense of bewilderment and loss after everything they knew came to an end when the Babylonian Empire conquered and destroyed Jerusalem, sending the people into exile in a faraway land. Hear now these words of scripture. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and there we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung up our harps. For there our captors asked us for songs, and our tormentors asked for mirth, saying, Sing us one of those songs of Zion. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Amen. Our New Testament reading shares a story of the Apostle Paul and Silas out in the world sharing the story of Jesus Christ and suddenly finding themselves arrested after they brought to an end a scheme by which people were profiting from use of a slave girl. Listen now for God's word in this passage from the book of Acts, chapter 16, verses 19b through 34. They seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they had brought them before the magistrates, they said, these men are disturbing our city. They are Jews and are advocating customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to adopt or observe. 
The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, he put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was an earthquake, so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer called for lights, and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them, and he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God of our trust and salvation, be with us now. Still all voices in us but your own. Guide our meditations upon you and let our lives be renewed and refreshed by the words we have just heard. Amen. I have an important correction to make. Church is not canceled. You may have heard otherwise. If so, you have heard wrong. If you walk up to the doors of 533 South Walnut Street in Springfield, Illinois, you might find them locked. But church is not canceled. The confusion is understandable. We aren't the first ones to go down this road. The ancient people of Jerusalem were besieged locked within their own walls for over a year with dwindling supplies, and then conquered and exiled to Babylon. And their place of worship, the temple, the house of the Lord, was not just locked, it was burned and torn to pieces. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and there we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there, we hung up our harps. I wonder if we feel as though we must now do the same, hang up our harps for the next few weeks or months. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Many of us are alone, isolated, distanced from one another and from life as we know it. Even more troublingly, we know this is only the beginning of an exile whose time we do not know. But I want to offer you again this truth. Church is not canceled. Church is never canceled. And you know this if you are one who grew up in the church. For we are told from childhood that church is not a building, nor merely a ritual of Sunday morning. Church is what you are, what we are, when we live as the church. Today, our world has found itself facing pandemic and uncertainty. Illness and our attempts to stop it have left all kinds of things shut down, closed, canceled. But we are not left with nothing left to do, just another institution forced to come to a halt, waiting and hoping to go back into operation as soon as this time has passed. No, the opposite is true. This is a time in which we are called to step forward and shift into gear. This pandemic is a worldwide crisis. People are suffering and anxious. 
This is a moment of worldwide need. And that means it is a moment where the church can, in a way, shine. As bearers of the light, as something whose existence means something in an undeniable way. It can shine to its members as a family of spiritual reassurance and in the practical meeting of needs, and it can shine to the community around it as a demonstration of calm hope in the face of worldly threats combined with a no-holds-barred living out of its mandate to serve its neighbors. Crisis is a place of loss, suffering, and hardship. It is also a place where those things can be met by a kind of beauty and depth in imaginative response that goes beyond the ordinary. Are we willing to bring our faith and imagination to bear on this moment? It takes seeing things from a perspective that is not the obvious one. Did you listen to the story told in our second reading today? Paul and Silas were in confinement. Perhaps you can relate. Theirs was a literal imprisonment. There was no question of their being in the pews that day. But it was clear from the beginning of this narrative that they did not think of church as a place where they went, for the worship went with them as they prayed and sang hymns, the other prisoners listening along. But the really interesting part comes next. An earthquake knocking the prison doors open and breaking the chains holding everyone tight, including the unjustly imprisoned Paul. In the midst of this sudden chaos, what does Paul see? What does he find important here? Not his own chance to get away. Not even the turmoil around him is what he latches onto. He sees the need of a fellow human being. One who believes his failure is so great that his life is altogether over. And Paul reaches out to him in reassurance. Paul met that man in the midst of disarray and mutual crisis, and he stopped and chose to be the church to that man. And that made all the difference. So thankful the guard was that he was trembling, having thought the entire prison had escaped on his watch. And maybe we have some of that work to do ourselves. That work of looking at things in the strange, upside-down way Jesus Christ taught his followers to do. Where what may happen to our bodies or possessions is much less important than living our lives as the right sort of persons. Where our hope is in something deeper and truer that cannot be taken away from us by disease or any other worldly loss. It is this perspective of calm, confident readiness to live to our neighbor's gain that has always been the intriguing, shining light which has perplexed and drawn in the world. The Christian church has never lived fully as the church, but it has never entirely ceased to be the church either. And it has often been by reaching out into the kind of thing we see around us today that it has most fully lived up to its name. Remember that half the hospital capacity in this city exists because the church, the people who follow Jesus Christ, have always been committed and remain committed to meeting people in their moments of need. Uncertainty abounds today, and we do not know what exactly is to come. But we can pretty clearly see that this present moment will offer plenty of occasion for meeting people in their moments of need. I have great hope for the capacity of this congregation to mobilize in response to what faces us. There is an opportunity here. Well, there are opposite opportunities here, actually. Some people will look at all the fear and see the opportunity to buy the entire shelf of baby formula at the grocery store and then resell it at inflated prices. I think it is our duty to work contrary to those forces in the world by seeing a different opportunity, the chance to drop the unimportant stuff that takes over our lives and step in where some new hole of need has opened up. And an interesting piece of this 
is that there is no area of the church's life that does not bring a chance for doing something, a choice between backing away from or stepping up to the plate. There are people starting these conversations already. Yes, they are only tentative as everyone scrambles to figure out how to navigate a situation that is changing daily or hourly. But people who have taken up congregational care as their focus are talking about what it means to meet the needs of this faith family. People whose work is mission and community service are talking about how to understand the complex needs of the community around us. Worship leaders are trying to adapt and keep the whole church body in worshipful practice and continued connection to the word. Those for whom prayer is a major calling will have plenty to do over this time. Creative work is being put into keeping fellowship and learning alive for children, youth, and families. The leadership of the church is taking up new questions daily. People with technological skills are jumping in and providing assistance in making sure things can get done remotely that used to get done in person. What does it mean for the whole church, the particular church, the regional church, the worldwide church, to mobilize? to awaken, to step up and shine in the world's moment of need. What does it mean for you and me to be the church? I suppose it is time for us to find out. Because any rumors that might exist to the contrary, the church is not shut down. Nearly two millennia ago, the one whom we follow gave an order. Go, he said and we are still going. For remember, he then promised, I am with you always to the end of the age. And from that day forward, there has never been such a thing as canceling the church. Church is a continuous thing. We are the church. We are to be the church. Wherever we find ourselves, whatever our circumstances, whatever befalls us, and whatever befalls the world. We are to be church to each other. We are to be church to our neighbors, worshiping and praying and serving and caring and imagining all of that work into new shapes to fit each new moment. If what you need is to be the church, or if what you need is for someone to be the church for you, we want you to know church is not canceled.
At this time, we gather for the prayers of the people, remembering those with special needs and concerns, spoken and unspoken. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, sometimes it is difficult to conceive how it is that the one who created the ends of the earth the one who does not faint or grow weary, would join us on the journey of humanity, would embrace us in a love beyond our understanding, a love that is persistent and sacrificial. As if this was not enough, we are mindful that we have a God whose spirit abides within us, encouraging, advocating, teaching, and empowering us in the ebb and flow of our changing lives. Teach us to love one another as you love us. Give us the fortitude and integrity to keep from becoming small, judgmental people who think our way and perspective are the only ones that you honor. Give us the courage and wisdom to accept the losses that are a part of life with as much grace as Jesus did on his journey toward the cross. We thank you for all the acts of kindness offered by the friends in this community of faith. In each act, we see a glimpse of who you are, dear God. Renew our faith in you and deepen our understanding of who you call us to be as the church. We remember those among us with special needs. We pray for those who mourn. We pray for those who long for physical and emotional health. We pray for those who are cold and hungry and displaced. We pray for our children and youth and the challenges and disappointments before them during this time. How grateful we are for the potential of their young lives and the joy and privilege of being a part of their journeys. We pray for those persons in positions of leadership within our government and medical community and ask for an extra measure of your grace and humility as we face this pandemic. We pray for those nations, communities, families, and individuals most affected by this outbreak. And we pray for the medical professionals who are most at risk serving the sick. Help us to resist and reject fear and suspicion based on ethnicity or nationality as this virus is affecting all people. Merciful God, as a potter fashions a vessel from humble clay, you form us into a new creation. Shape us day by day through the cross of Christ your Son until we pray as continually as we breathe and all our acts are prayer. And so we pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and glory forever. Amen. Westminster believes we are in the world for ministry. We are grateful for the financial support of this faith community. Your gifts continue to be essential during this season. We invite you to consider giving through our website on the Giving tab. Checks can be mailed to the church. 
Coats for our Lenten drive and give a meal a month bags can be dropped off in the West Narthex. The one great hour of sharing denominational offering is received during Lent and will be dedicated on Palm Sunday. This offering supports the Presbyterian Disaster Assistance, Presbyterian Hunger Program, and self-development of people. Let us join together in the prayer of dedication. In gratitude, O God, we come into your presence. For all that you have done for us, most especially for your steadfast love in times of loneliness and isolation, and we offer our thanks and praise. We long to be the church, doing what is pleasing to you and being your vision through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. As you go forth into your day, be of good courage, remembering that the church still surrounds you, and hearing the call to be the church to the world. And may the Lord be with you, in the space where you are, and in all the space between us. Amen. <laughs>